Okay, um, so hi everyone. Um, thanks all for coming today. Uh, today we are lucky to have uh, Regan Mazur. Um, she uh, received her PhD from Harvard Statistics Department in 2019, and she is currently um, assistant professor at Bentley University. And her research includes causal inference and text analysis. And today uh, we hear her new research on recent adventures in causal ish inference with text as data. So, um, Megan. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right. Is everybody able to see? Yeah, great. All right, so yeah, thank you for having me. It's uh, great to be back here. This seminar was always a staple of um, my routine throughout my graduate years at Harvard. So it's always a great, um, uh, great opportunity to be back and back around familiar faces. So today I'm going to talk about um, some of the recent applied work that I've been doing um, using uh, methods and, and other methodological developments I've been working on for inference with text. Um, and I, I say causal-ish here because in general, my research agendas is motivated by um, some purely causal um, applications and causal methods. Uh, but lately I've gotten into some more general applied research involving text um, that sort of deviates beyond the scope of causality. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some different things both in and out of the causal realm. Um, just to give you some context on uh, some of the different text-based applications, um, applied projects that I have been or am currently involved in, uh, text seems to be increasingly uh, available in a wide variety of domains. So at this point, I feel like I've seen text in uh, just about every sub-discipline there is, uh, from medicine to political science, which was actually how I got into text, um, looking at um, educational interventions and education research, and even to more broad public health and public policy uh, types of analyses. Um, so I've ordered these different applications from uh, most causal up top, sort of the most pure uh, incorporation of using text as data to facilitate causal inference in randomized trials where you would typically be estimating a treatment impact and you have text data available. And at the bottom, uh, we get into more non-causal, just purely interesting applied research that involves text and uh, thinking about how to use text to improve inferences um, in ways that we might not have considered before, or we might not have been able to before. So I'll touch on a couple of these examples today. Um, but in general, the theme that all of the applications that I'm going to present um, touch on is based on the idea that texts are increasingly available, uh, but they're somewhat underutilized. And texts present an interesting and exciting opportunity for new applied research because text data offer a lot of rich information about units. So particularly in the setting of causal inference, uh, in a randomized trial, text data provide this really rich source of covariates and of outcomes that we might not otherwise have available. But text is a little bit of a double-edged sword because it's so rich uh, and difficult to quantify. It can be difficult to operationalize and to use for quantitative analyses. 
So uh, starting out from the place of a uh, perfect world, in an absolutely perfect world, if we wanted to learn from text data, uh, the gold standard for taking in that text and turning it into something that we can use for credible inference and particularly credible causal inference, uh, the gold standard is human judgment. So evaluating and operationalizing text through this sort of rigorous process of qualitative analysis where humans identify a set of qualitative constructs that they want to measure from text data. And then they develop a scoring rubric, a protocol for how that text is going to be scored and measured consistently. And then they go through and measure all of the different constructs of interest. So to take in all of this text and turn it into a quantitative data set that we can actually analyze statistically requires all of this sort of groundwork uh, in terms of human evaluation. But of course, we don't live in the perfect world. And in the real world, text can be difficult to work with and difficult to analyze. I think the reason that texts are often underutilized um, in studies where they're available is that this perfect procedure of going through and coding for specific constructs that we wanna measure from text data is really costly and, and time consuming. So you can imagine um, if I have a collection of texts and I want to evaluate 10 different dimensions, uh, measures of um, uh, partisanship or polarity or other general metrics that capture sentiment. That process of developing a rubric, uh, manually scoring everything is often just not scalable, not practical. In addition to that, human evaluation um, for text analysis can be largely subjective. So even if we've identified a set of constructs that we want to code, um, we still have to have human raters read and evaluate a bunch of text documents. That can lead to inconsistencies, particularly when you have multiple raters. And the, uh, often when you are coding for specific constructs, um, the rubrics can be open to interpretation. So it's not necessarily the case that once we identify some construct that we're gonna measure, we're going to measure it perfectly using human judgment. And finally, even the best human coding efforts uh, often may be leaving data on the table due to what's actually practical in the real world. So lately I've been working with several studies that have put in the uh, grunt work to identify a set of constructs from text that they're gonna code, hire human raters to go through and code thousands and thousands of documents on different dimensions. And even after all of that work, uh, you still have typically only a small number of text-based variables that can be measured by human efforts. Uh, so there are potentially a lot of other aspects of text, other information in text that we're leaving on the table that could help us out in terms of inference uh, that we're just not able to measure through the human coding process. So a little bit of a roadmap for this talk. Um, as I said before, my agenda at large um, and the majority of my work over the past couple of years has been focused on developing methods for incorporating text into particularly causal analyses uh, to not replace the human coding process, but make it more efficient uh, to expedite that process and be able to better leverage text data that's available to us and uh, get as much information out of it as possible.
And I want to emphasize that um, my focus is definitely uh, the as much is really important. I think I found particularly in recent months, the importance of the human evaluation, human evaluation and basing the things that we do, the things that we extract and learn from text on actual ways that people think about text data, people think about language and writing. So um, with that in mind today, I'm gonna present three different applied projects that I've been working on recently that sort of showcase how um, the different tools that I've been working on in my methodological work can actually be applied. Uh, so the majority of my work focus on developing and validating different methods, comparing different tools for using text as data and causal inference. But today I'm going to focus more on once all of those decisions have been made about what particular models to use for text and how it's going to be incorporated into the analysis, what that actually looks like. So I'm going to showcase um, a couple of places where adding in text data that is otherwise not utilized or um, isn't being fully taken advantage of, how we can actually use that available information to enhance analyses that we would be doing otherwise. And two sort of sub themes that will come up in these different applications are, one, how can we scale up human coding efforts um, to make that process of quantifying information in text more efficient so that humans don't have to spend all of their time coding and coding and coding a bunch of documents. And then separately, how can we leverage uh, that additional information that's sort of left on the table bit um, of text that is not otherwise being used specifically to support causal inferences. All right, so first, uh, an application focused on scaling up human coding efforts. This is a project um, with some collaborators at Bentley. So we have data from uh, a database called NVDRS. It's managed by the CDC and it's the National Violent Death Reporting System. So anytime there is a violent death in the United States, it gets logged in the system and we have access to a subset of that that I'll explain in a moment. Um, but these, this database records um, information about the victim victims of violent deaths each year and so whenever there's an incidence of death um, they record the basic demographic information about the victim some basic medical history um, history of um, substance abuse and mental illness and things like that and then a toxicology report that is uh, collected at the time uh, as close to the time of death as possible. In addition, we also have these written narratives from law enforcement and EMTs that are collected at the time of uh, the death case, so at the time of the incident. So within this CDC massive database, uh, there are these huge collections of narrative texts that are typically quite long, uh, where law enforcement officers who have been called to a violent death describe the entire context surrounding the case. So they'll talk about who was there, who was involved, were um, other first responders called, was 911 called, et cetera. And how this information gets used uh, by the CDC is that state level abstractors are trained to code this database to look at all of the available information and determine a manner of death classification. And in particular, this is how we estimate the prevalence of suicide. 
So at the state level, there are general protocols for determining manner of death. But one thing to note is that in absence of a suicide note, in cases where suicide is suspected, without a suicide note, the protocols vary considerably from state to state about how a death can be classified as suicide. So in some states, you don't necessarily need that note. Uh, the abstractors can determine intent for suicide based on other factors. In other states, almost no cases that don't, almost no suspected suicide cases, if they don't have a suicide note, they're not gonna be classified as suicide. So this creates a big issue for suicide prevention, estimation, and reporting. Essentially, just getting an accurate estimate of the rate of suicide within states and nationally on a yearly basis is complicated by the fact that we have this set of undetermined cases that don't necessarily meet the criteria for being classified as suicide. And that could be because there was not a suicide note, or it could be because um, there's just not enough information to determine whether it was suicide or something else. And one thing to note, so the data that we have access to is from 2017, um, and the cases we have are only those labeled as homicide, suicide, or undetermined. So there's a separate area of the database where they record accidental deaths and any sort of uh, death, violent or otherwise, that was deemed an accident. But almost 10% of the data of the cases in 2017 are undetermined. So there's potentially up to a 10% error in um, reporting of suicide prevalence, 3,600 cases or so, um, that we don't necessarily know if they should have been classified as suicide. So the main research question um, that we've been addressing in this work is, can we use machine measures of text that are available in the written narratives to help identify um, intent for suicide among those undetermined cases? So because the protocol for classifying a case as suicide is inconsistent. And because uh, you have human abstractors, human coders, reading through these very long, very um, uh, comprehensive and, and, and often technical narratives about what happened, um, uh, there may be more objective measures that if we just look at aspects of language within the narratives, there may be indicators for suicidal intent that the abstractors are missing when reading through the individual narratives. But when you look at the data as a whole or the text as a whole, they become more clear. So what uh, we've done with this data set, we want to identify indicators of suicidal intent with the ultimate goal of uh, getting a better estimate of suicide prevalence. So how we've approached this is we started out generating a whole array of potential mach machine measures of text. And this is part of the methodological work that I've done separately. Um, is building a system that's uh, available through TextMatch, which is a, an R package available right now, the development, development version on GitHub. But it takes in a corpus of text and outputs all of the machine measures that can be automatically evaluated um, without any supervision, without any human coding. So these are things like measures of uh, parts of speech, how many pronouns, how many verbs. These are validated dictionary-based features, things like the readability score, the lexical diversity, um, any other sort of metrics that have been developed in the computational linguistics realm. We also have um, 
mappings, uh, features that are derived from um, embeddings trained on separate data. So the word to back map mappings in general are trained on um, news articles from Google and a separate Stanford cor uh, corpus. But these are learned embeddings that map each document to an array of themes that have been learned separately. And finally, um, we have several distance-based features that basically compute how similar or dissimilar a given text is from a set of reference texts. So these are all things that can be evaluated automatically. And once we have this array of features, um, this is gonna serve as a hopefully rich feature set to characterize the text that we use to model the probability of suicide using the known cases. So um, what we did for this analysis was using, setting aside the undetermined cases that we're trying to learn about. Um, we did a test train split of the suicide and homicide cases. So those are our known cases of suicide and known cases of not suicide. And with those labeled cases, um, again, using some of the functionality provided by TextMatch, we train a uh, ensemble of machine learners to predict incidents of suicide. So on the training data, we select a model. Uh, the tuning parameters for the final predictive ensemble are all chosen within that training sample via cross-validation. And then um, to see whether or not we can get any sort of indication of suicidal intent just with the homicide versus suicide case texts, we then evaluated the classification accuracy on the uh, test data. So the idea here being if we can build a really good predictive model for predicting suicide using just known suicide versus homicide cases, we can then apply that to the set of undetermined cases to get a better idea of um, how many might potentially have indications for suicide, how many could potentially uh, be more appropriately classified as suicide cases. So the Sorry. first, Can yeah. A quick question. Absolutely. Yes. So I guess, um, so this approach doesn't really care much about the interpretation of what, you know, what sort of constitutes a suicide or what's predictive of that. Uh, so we, we get more into that in okay. the, yeah, in, in the full analysis. Um, here, I'm, I'm mostly focusing on uh, just how the text methods can be used. But in the paper, we do go into um, once, once we've built this model, then looking into, okay, what is it that's making something high probability of suicide? And um, how can we use that to, to potentially um, update the protocol for classifying suicide and, and w what can we learn from that as well. Okay. So yeah, Reagan, that's you, definitely. Sorry, R Reagan, do you, do you code the inconsistencies in how they define suicide and, and include, include that uh, in this analysis? Um, that's something that we want to do. It's not something that we've done yet. We do have um, state we have state labels for each case. Um, so that's something we're looking into in the future is quantifying sort of the level of adherence to protocol or how strict the protocol is for classifying suicide and adding that in. Mm -hmm. But no, that's not, that's not used here. So who decides whether it's suicide? A state abstractor. Which, like and it's tip not the machine. Yeah, the, the abstract, well, the abstractor in general, like at the CDC, they're not using machine learning at all. So someone looks through every text and it's just one human evaluator. And then once things get labeled as undetermined, they don't get factored into prevalence rates for suicide or homicide. They're just sort of there. Okay. 
but do they have like official criteria or do they uh, they do. Um, I, the The main criteria is, is like generally just th there must be intent. There must be clear evidence that the victim had intent for suicide, which is difficult when there's no note because you have to base intent on what everybody else is saying about the person. Would you know, would you know um, what the Intercoda reliability is on the abstractor? They typically only have one abstractor per case. Right, but I mean, you know, if you, I mean, we, we, you, could you replicate it? I mean, it would be interesting. Oh, right? that's actually, that's a great idea. Um, yeah, no, that is something that I'll look into. I would imagine <laughs> it would be pretty good, which I'll show here, if we were to just use the, um model to predict suicide and compare th those classifications against the human raider i think that's what you're saying gary <clears throat> no i just mean take two human raiders have them read the text like if they agree more than 80 percent of the time it's probably a miracle right because it just doesn't usually happen with text um in fact actually there's a statistical question associated with that so i'm i think that's probably not the number because it's always the number right um, yeah, and and there's probably a reason why they only have one coder, right? Because, because right, it's not, it's not clear because they really have to come to one answer, which is really interesting. But if but let's suppose they agree eighty percent of the time, which which is probably would probably be pretty good in this kind of difficult situation. Um, um, like if your classification, your classification, I mean, if you were correct eighty two percent of the time, like you'd have to be lying, right? <laughs> it would sort of be impossible. Um, um, and so it'd be nice to know that the ceiling was only 80% and then you could get there and that'd be really great. Um, uh, the other thing, the, the statistical question is that this is always, it's always the case that like the gold standard itself, the truth is rusty, right? The truth has these holes in it. And it's not that there's an other category because if you, if you, in my experience anyway, if you add the other category and you have the humans code in, in this case, suicide, not suicide, homicide, other, and you know, or you add an extra other category, it does not help. It usually makes it worse. Um, yeah. Like there's no way to actually get, get above 80% for any set of categories. And if you add more categories or try to clarify it, it doesn't, it doesn't really get anywhere. So it seems to me that's a fundamental characteristic of human language and, and therefore a fundamental um, issue for statistics, for modeling that we, we haven't really figured out how to do. And it, it's interestingly displayed in this, in this example. Yeah, no, I, I love that point. I think that's something that I've thought about a lot. It's like a deeper philosophical question about like, if our model can, can predict things more consistently than, than humans would, it, it, in, in one, like in one direction, that, that's a good idea. But when you remember that the, the goal is to actually model human behavior, which is inherently inconsistent, and that's what we're trying to learn from, it's sort of, yeah. And I think like the, the predictive ensemble has some potential to, to assist there by developing models that can, can serve as, separate models that can serve as, as uh, separate pseudo raters. But I, that's something I've thought about a lot. And yeah, really interesting um, rabbit hole to go down philosophically, I think. All right, so um, back to this application, conditioning on text, one of the key findings um, is just conditioning on text in addition to structured covariates. If we build a model to predict um, suicide versus not suicide based on only the demographic and toxicology information that we have available, and then we build another model where we add in the text data, we can do considerably better by incorporating those additional text features, um, which makes sense uh, from the stance that using just the demographic information alone, um, in absence of a suicide note, you really need context about the circumstances surrounding death to make a decision about suicide. 
that stuff is just not going to be contained in structured covariates. It all is captured within the narrative text. So um, adding in these machine measures of text that are potentially capturing some of those uh, contexts within the narratives improves our ability to accurately classify suicide versus not suicide on our testing sample. Um, so we get like 96% classification accuracy for the model that uses both the structured and text-based covariates um, on our testing data with a optimal threshold for identifying suicide around 0.55. A quick, quick question on that. It, how much of that is driven by text that says something to the effect of there was a suicide note? Great question. We uh, eliminated any, uh, in, any key words that would indicate that there definitely was a suicide, since those um, should always get labeled as suicide and therefore are not going to show up in the undetermined cases. Um, so they're not going to be useful for us in, in that regard. So we've had a set of terms and phrases that we screened for and removed uh, before generating the text features. But the but the cases themselves that had a note were included in the in the training sample. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and that that's something that that we don't right now have um, information unless we look for it specifically within the text, um, we don't have a variable, variable for each case that says did include a note or did not. So uh, the second key finding here is um, when we apply the best identified model from the last step, um, so the model that worked best for predicting suicide among known suicide versus homicide cases, applying that to the set of undetermined cases, we get a very different story from the model that uses text than from a model that's based on structured covariates alone. Um, a couple things to note here, for the, the model based on structured covariates alone, um, those variables shouldn't have a lot of information that would necessarily point towards suicidal intent and undetermined cases, it, it's unclear. So we would expect the distribution um, for uh, probability of suicide in undetermined cases based on just those variables to look somewhat uniform, which it roughly does here. Um, at least we see probability spread across the board. When we do incorporate the text data, um, the picture shifts and there's, um, the results suggest that there are potentially a lot more cases where there may be indications of intent for suicide. That doesn't necessarily mean that those cases were suicide. It just means that they may be warrant further consideration. Um, and so incorporating the probability of suicide for these cases could be used to estimate, to adjust the estimate of overall suicide incidents. But in the paper, we go on to talk about um, what this probability model means um, in terms of suicide identification in general. So if we look just at those undetermined cases that have a really high probability of suicide and start parsing out what are the words, phrases, and themes um, in those really high probability cases that differentiate them from low probability of suicide cases, we find things like loss of job. Um, and uh, indicators that the victim had ongoing uh, medical issues or medical conditions. Um, so a lot of potential there for figuring out themes, over overarching themes and indicators for suicide that 
an individual abstractor reading through thousands of narratives might not necessarily pick up on um, without a, a sort of larger pattern. All right. So that's the first application, which is the least causal of the bunch, because we really just want to scale up the human coding efforts, help improve the code, human coding efforts, and learn more about suicide indications uh, using the data that's available. Now I'm going to shift to um, leveraging uncoded aspects of text uh, to support causal inference first in a randomized experiment and then second in an observational study. So first, uh, randomized trials with text-based outcomes. I'm going to talk about um, the how we might use the text that's sort of left over um, in a randomized experiment to learn more about the mechanism of treatment impact. So in this direction, uh, another project that I've been involved with um, pretty heavily over the last year or so is based on a trial uh, done by the Reeves Lab at the um, Ed School at Harvard. Uh, so Jimmy Kim, who runs that lab, um, his team did a randomized trial. And they do these ongoing um, cluster randomized trials of different instructional strategies. Uh, and they're evaluating how a particular educational intervention, in this case, impacts students' writing. So there are about 3,000 first and second graders that we have data on so far who were randomly assigned to either receive a particular classroom instruction for a few weeks or to have uh, typical instruction, um, the standard curriculum for that same period of time. At the end of that period, all students then took an assessment um, to gauge their argumentative writing abilities in both science and social studies. So they essentially wrote two separate essays, um, both the treatment and control students, arguing for or against a particular topic in both science and social studies. And in that trial, uh, because the primary outcome is this function of text, this holistic quality of writing, um, they have manually evaluated all of the student essays. Um, so the coding process is, is very rigorous. I would say with the Reeds team, they have um, a whole uh, development period for generating rubrics for scoring the different student essays. They then train raters multiple raters um, rate each essay, and if there are any disagreements, it goes to an additional sort of super rater um, who updates the rubric iter iteratively until everyone agrees on the writing scores. So we have a, a, a really good gauge of um, human coded outcomes in this particular study. And uh, looking just at those human coded scores, um, comparing average essay quality in treatment and control um, across both grades, we do see significant positive treatment impacts on the quality of students writing in both science and social studies with a, a little bit bigger of an impact in the social studies domain. So the question we focused on here is, how can we use automated evaluations of text to unpack these top line impacts? So essentially, humans have already gone through and coded every essay for holistic writing quality. But there are a lot of other outcomes that can be, automate, can be automatically evaluated, can be measured using standard machine methods, things like readability or um, breadth of vocabulary, uh, different psychological dimensions. Those are all outcomes that could have been evaluated by human coders as well, but we have 
machine measures of those constructs. So here we looked at estimating treatment impacts on different machine measures of text as a way to learn more about how the treatment is impacting student writing beyond knowing that it does increase the overall writing scores. So a uh, similar overall approach here. The first step was to take in the text and turn it into a large array of features that can all serve as um, outcome measures, the secondary outcomes in our impact analysis. Uh, so again, we looked at just basic structural features of the text. Uh, we also used um, linguistic inquiry word count, which is a popular tool in the psychological literature for evaluating the psychological state of a writer. So this measures things like um, what sort of social processes is uh, the student referencing in their writing? Or um, is the writing more analytical versus more emotional? We have other measures of text cohesion and, and some um, linguistic indices. And using all of these features, um, in our analyses, we sort of separated these out into um, a set of planned comparisons that were the aspects of text, certain psychological dimensions that, that we suspected there would be treatment impacts, and then a separate set, which is a really large set of uh, one to 200 other outcomes that we could analyze um, as outcome measures, but we didn't necessarily have any hypotheses about. And then we just estimated treatment impacts with respect to each of these different outcomes and applied different um, multiple correct or adjustments for multiple corrections since we're doing a lot of hypothesis tests. And the goal here is really not necessarily to have a uh, perfect estimate of um, treatment impact or a perfect idea of significance, we're really more looking for signal about uh, features for which there are obvious differences between treatment and control. So this is just a subset of um, some of the results. Uh, the key finding was um, primarily in this study, we were able to learn a lot by using these text-based features as auxiliary outcomes um, in the impact analysis to, to sort of unpack the overall effect on student writing. So the treatment impacts for some of the uh, text outcomes are more noticeable and more consistent in the social studies category, the plots on the right. Um, in particular, clout is something that we see in social studies is much higher for students in the treatment group and this is a measure of confidence in writing and expertise as compared to um, a more uh, hesitant tentative writing style so those significantly higher scores on clout and lower scores on authenticity and emotional tone in social studies um, seem to suggest that the treatment is impacting students by giving them more confidence about their writing or by um, providing a framework for writing their essays that's more formal and less open to emotions and opinions uh, than what the students are writing in the control group. Um, and in the science category, we see a few things, uh, a few patterns there, the impacts are less pronounced there. Um, we see for second graders in particular, they have a notably higher readability score, but less clout 
and higher analytical thinking. And these could be due to just the topic that you're writing about. Um, potentially analytical thinking and writing is more important than clout, but clout is more important in determining quality of writing uh, about social studies topics. All right. And other analyses, um, some of the unplanned comparisons, uh, we found additional results that, again, just backed up, um, all seem to indicate treatment students are writing with less emotional tone, less opinionated, um, more formal argumentative structure, making claims about their arguments and then following up with evidence as compared to stating opinions um, and using adjectives. So um, the idea based on these results um, is that we could potentially learn a lot about mechanism of treatment impact just by looking at the impacts on these machine measures that don't require any coding that are readily available um, to analyze after we've estimated treatment impact on a human coded outcome. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh -huh. So in these two examples, I guess like the how the texts are used is, is kind of different. One, the first one is more of the predictor side and this is more mm -hmm. of the outcome side. Yep. But so that your sort of proposal or the approach is to, regardless of how you're gonna use or regardless of the role that uh, the feature is gonna play at the actual analysis, you're gonna basically summarize first and then use that. Or do you think it's possible to improve, let's say interpretability or something like that by thinking about how you actually use the text? So I'm just curious about that, yeah. Yeah, so I think um, like one of the, the things that I found is, is there, there are a lot of different uh, text analysis methods and ways to summarize text that are available. But there's not a lot of clear um, uh, guidelines for like, I, I want to learn more about one specific aspect of my data using text, or I want to use the text that's available to evaluate treatment impact. Like when you have actual real data applications where text is available, it can be difficult to sift through all of the different methods that are out there. So I think um, the, my idea with these different applications is sort of the, the methods are getting developed in the background that are pointed specifically at text for prediction in classification models, text for um, text-based outcomes for estimating treatment impact in randomized trials. And then separately, I'll show in a minute, text as covariates for um, better um, adjustment for potential confounders in, in other settings. So I think, yeah, the idea is to sort of set up a, a workflow where you can pinpoint the methods that you need to use for your particular data application and see how that can actually be implemented in a principled way to actually produce results and how that can supplement additional analyses. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Very good. Um, so I had, so it's, I mean, this is an interesting study and I was thinking that, so like earlier you showed some like, human coded outcome. And so here it's sort of, um, I guess, machine coded text outcomes. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to see if there's a way to connect the two. So you can imagine that, like, you know, if there's sort of human, uh, the concepts that humans are interested in. So I guess these human coders are reading these texts and then coming up with some concept and quantifying that with maybe some categorical variable or binary variable. Mm -hmm. 
it would be nice to see, like, it's almost like a text of the mediator and like what features of the text really explains the outcome. Because often the outcome, even though it, it could be like coded at zero one or whatever the ordinal category, it's often the vague and it's, it's unclear what part of the text that's really representing that concept. So if you, like, if you pick the, I guess the idea might be um, like select, like statistically selecting some of these features that best, you know, I guess um, predict the outcome, like large effect on the outcome or something like that. Like a mm -hmm. modifier or maybe it's a mediator because it's sort of the intermediate outcome. That, that would be, I think, interesting because that, that will sort of give additional information beyond the, the sort of human coded outcome. And then it connects the two as opposed to like each one separately, you know, analyzing. Yeah, that's a great idea. And, and, and it relates to something that I've, I've thought about, which is like, if you, if you do just use all of these text features to predict the human coded outcomes, um, it, it gets back at, at a similar philosophical question to what Gary raised earlier, which is like, should we be able to predict human coded outcomes really well based on all of these different features? Because like, I, it, in some sense, it, it would make sense that if a student has high readability scores and uses, you know, some ratio of nouns to adjectives, like it would make sense that there should be some extent to which we can predict human coded scores using purely objective measures of text. But at the same time, there is that extra human element that's like, even if text scores perfectly or scores really well on all of these different machine measures, it could still end up with a low overall score. So, so that sort of gets at like, what are we missing in the text? What, what machine measures are we missing that like humans are picking up on, but we don't have a way to quantify objectively? Yeah, I, I really like the idea of, of the text as a mediator though. Yes, I think I'm thinking about like if somebody gets affected by the treatment and say human, there's a big effect on the human coded outcome, then the, some part of the text is also should be affected, right? But it, at the end of the day, it's yeah. a text that's really changing. And the connection from the text to the outcome is, is sort of human conception. So there should be some direct connection there and it'd be nice to, um, you know, it, it's more than just that these measures correlate, it's more like using the intervention that the effect also correlates, which gives much more causal, you know, um, understanding of the, um, how the treatment, like I guess it have impact on sort of vague abstract concept that people are interested in. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's great. All right. All right, last uh, direction application I'm gonna uh, talk about is causal inference impact evaluation in a separate setting um, where uh, we're in, we have non-randomized data, we want to estimate treatment impacts on a measure that has nothing to do with text, uh, but we have text-based covariates that contain a lot of information about potential confounders. So the setup here, um, this is data from the MIMIC3 database uh, managed by um, a team at MIT. And the particular study that uh, we've been focusing on is an observational study on the impact of this uh, procedure, this ECHO procedure on mortality rates for ICU patients. Um, so this is a, a special type of ECHO that 
can either be administered uh, within a certain window when a patient's admitted to the ICU or not administered. And we have um, data from 2,500 or so ICU patients, roughly half of them um, upon being admitted received TTE uh, within like a 12 to 24 hour window and the other half did not. So the goal here is to estimate uh, the impact of receiving TTE on 28 day survival post admission to see if administering this particular procedure um, improves survival rates for these types of patients. And because this data is non-randomized, um, we have to adjust for potential confounders. Obviously, patients coming into the ICU are at all sorts of different states of severity. Um, they might have different prognoses for their time in the ICU. They might have different conditions uh, that are being treated and comorbidities. So we need to account for all of these things um, when trying to estimate treatment impact. And how this is typically done, and how this has been done um, in uh, one published study on this data is to use propensity score matching on a set of structured covariates um, that are available for the patients, things like demographics, vitals, other lab data taken um, upon admission. Um, so in other applications, they've matched on those variables and estimated treatment impact that way. But in addition to the structured variables, we have a whole lot of text um, that's just the digitized form of physicians and nurses intake notes. So after a patient is triaged in the ICU, um, whoever their primary clinician is um, records a lot of notes about comorbidities, circumstances surrounding the patient being admitted. And uh, right now, those data have not been used for helping um, adjust for potential confounders. Those are sort of a separate part of the data that haven't been leveraged thus far. So our goal here is to try to um, use some automated measures of text, uh, use those as covariates that we can adjust for and match on um, when designing this observational study in order to ultimately strengthen the assumption of selection on observables when we're estimating treatment impacts. Uh, the text in particular contain a lot of information about potential confounders. Um, so uh, to me, it seems like to really believe in your statement of um, selection on observables, if you have all of these all this observable information within text, it makes sense to use it and make sure that uh, matched treatment and control samples that are gonna be used and compared for causal inference are both structurally similar and similar in terms of descriptive features that capture potential confounder, confounding variables. Um, so the approach for this study is largely based on um, the uh, methods for matching text data, uh, political analysis paper. Um, so in that paper, we present a workflow for constructing and identifying um, the best text matching procedure for a particular application. And we apply that here. Uh, to find, develop a metric for uh, measuring the, the descriptive similarity between two patients based on their narrative texts in a way that aligns with physician judgment about patient similarity. So essentially, we um, generate a bunch of text features. We calculate the distance between them using a bunch of different metrics. And then we 
uh, got physicians to code a sample of um, matched documents and give their input on how similar those two patients were based on information in the text. And then we used those judgments, those human coded outcomes to identify the matching method that produces the most descriptively similar patients. Once we have uh, a matching method, which in this case is um, matching on a set of dictionary-based features, word counts, um, using cosine distance, we then um, use optimal pair matching to actually identify matched samples of treatment control and estimate treatment impact using those resulting samples. So results um, from this study in the plot, you can see the majority of the um, covariates. So this plot shows covariate balance uh, for the treatment and control patients on the structured variables, which is the majority of the variables there. And then the variables that have a little star next to them are text features. So these are features that after speaking with doctors and clinicians, these were a set of words or terms that they identified as, these are things that, that I would be looking for when reading the text to determine if two patients are similar. Did they both get Lasix? Is there a mention of uh, cardiology problems? Is there any mention of renal failure? So these are just covariates, a, a set of covariates we derive from the text um, based on that information. And you can see the unmatched samples have a lot of imbalances on covariates, including both the structured covariates and aspects of the text. If we just use standard propensity score matching to match the uh, samples, we end up with the red dots, so we get good covariate balance on the things that we're matching on, um, but if, if we're failing to account for the additional information in the text, we end up with remaining imbalances on some of those text-based features um, that were not used for matching. And these are, these five are just a subset of potentially many more aspects of text uh, that could represent potential confounders. And then finally, when incorporating the text matching method, so matching on text within propensity score calipers, we're able to get covariate balance that's satisfied across both the structured and unstructured covariates. Um, so the key finding um, or the key implication of the results from this study were just that um, by using the text matching method instead of just matching on the structured covariates, we can potentially be more confident that uh, the selection on observables assumption is satisfied, that, we, um, that we're not making a crazy assumption of no unmeasured confounders based on the information we have in the text. And so ultimately, hopefully, we end up with a more accurate estimate of the treatment effect. All right, so final thoughts on each of these different directions. Um, again, in general, I think each of these applications just reflects the idea that there's a lot of information available to us in text, uh, but it can be difficult to measure and difficult to incorporate in standard analyses and particularly difficult to do so in a way that's principled. Um, but uh, methodological development in this area with more methodological development in this area, hopefully, um, it will make it a lot easier for applied researchers to use things like text matching methods when text covariates are avail available. 
um, look at text-based outcomes to better understand treatment impact, and um, use other aspects of text to learn about uh, other elements of their data that they may not otherwise have been privy to. Like in the suicide um, death classification example, using that text and learning from that text can potentially allow us to um, develop a better system for coding and classifying suicide, which helps everybody. And then other some other directions that uh, I'm currently working on in this domain, um, the bias variance trade-off um, between human coding and machine coding is something that I'm really interested in, in particular if human coders are inconsistent um, in how they code things and a machine, a, a predictive model it could potentially score documents in a manner that is much more consistent. Um, there's a trade-off there in how much we're actually reflecting human judgment versus how precisely we're able to measure different constructs in text. Um, and that has, I think, a lot of implications in automated scoring methods. Um, so how, if we do have to hand code a bunch of documents, is there a way we can do so such that maybe we only have to code half of our data and we can leverage machine learning methods to predict scores for the rest? And then I think text is missing data is an interesting problem just because all of these applications of text um, assume that there is text to be analyzed. Um, and if we start to look at cases in each of these examples where text was not available, um, students who didn't write enough text for us to analyze or um, death cases where not much text is written, thinking about how to incorporate that I think is an interesting problem. And other directions, um, things like inference with learned features using things like topic models and other models of text um, and incorporating those in causal analyses sort of creates this circular problem where you're using your data to learn about your data and then making inferences with those learned features. So that's another thing I'm thinking about actively. But in general, I always like to end my talks with this. If you have text, I'd love to hear about it and um, hear about any applications involving text or any text data you have lying around. Um, always happy to chat text. And that's it. Thank you. My dog says hello. Hi, Megan. A really very interesting talk. My name is Sue. Um, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more about like the last slide when you started talking about supervised or semi-supervised models. So then mm -hmm. kind of similar, like instead of, I guess this presentation has kind of talked about human coding and then using machine models to kind of get more data from, like not leave data on the table. But then there's also, of course, like the supervised machine learning models where you kind of use human data, human label data as training data. But then you have the issue of kind of baking in biases of humans are making in their inconsistencies when you train on human data. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on, yeah, the, the, the supervised models. Yeah, yeah, I think it, it's a really interesting question and sort of uh, requires, I, I think the place to start, we have to um, impose some pretty strict assumptions about what the, the true score of something should be defined as. Um, so right now using what would a human rate this particular document as with respect to this construct, that's our gold standard. But you're absolutely right that humans have implicit biases, often it, it, things that influence their judgment that they're not even aware of. So should we 
be coding students' essay texts? Um, should we be trying to create a machine learner that that predicts like humans when we don't want to bake in those implicit biases into machine learning methods? And I think that's that's really the question that I'm I'm trying to get at in the bias variance trade-off. Um, starting out with, let's suppose that um, there is some true score and that uh, human raters are able to um, accurately estimate or human-based outcomes. If we use human-coded outcomes, uh, we can get an unbiased estimate of that true score for any one document within some error range. And so, so I think we have to start out with posing some structure about like how we define human judgments relative to what the true actual score means. And then um, starting from there, you can then start to explore like, okay, if a machine learner is able to decrease that bias, but at the cost of additional variance, what does that mean? And how does that change when we change our assumptions about what true values are and how well humans can code them? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think in general, it, it's, it's a challenging area because it's, it gets at a, I think, a much deeper philosophical question that I'm just not sure how to answer yet without a lot of, of strong assumptions. Thank you so much, Megan. I guess that's a super complicated question. I think a lot of people are trying to think about it and trying to figure it out, but it is like deep, right? It's like, yes. Thank you for your thoughts on it. Oh, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, I, hey, Regan, how's it going? This is really interesting stuff. Um, I had a question about the first, you know, the first uh, thing you did and with the kind of classifying suicide. And I just wonder a little bit about um, how, how, what your expectation is about people using these kind of measures or these predictions once they've, like once they've done them and to what extent, how, people might propagate uncertainty through to their, you know, so, so say they want to take these, okay, to have these new measures of suicide, and I want to use that in some way, either as like a dependent variable or an independent variable and some additional analyses. And so like, I, I saw this as like, almost like a missing data, like imputation, um, that's my own bias. But, uh, and so just kind of like thinking, I'm just trying to get your thoughts about like how, you know, what is there, are there best practices or do you have several recommendations about how to like, to incorporate the uncertainty of the machine learning model that you use to do the predictions uh, later on or, or anything like that? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and it's something I've been thinking about. I think uh, I, it's not something that I've ex explored deeply yet, but I, I think that the idea that we've been operating on is to use the predictions um, in uh, as, as, <laughs> sort of a a prior for the data like to build a, a larger bayesian model that incorporates the probability of suicide to propagate the uncertainty from those predictions into our estimate of prevalence of suicide so based on the probabilities generated from the model um we may or may not want to adjust our estimate for the number of suicide cases but that we have observed in any particular year. But we can certainly estimate the uncertainty around the number of suicide cases that have already been labeled as such. Um, and I think even like doing that, using the output from the model in that way would be beneficial because uh, there's, so much uncertainty um, at present about how many suicides there actually are. And that has really big implications for things like funding for prevention. Um, I think there, there's also a, a different direction to go in, which is um, 
using the predicted probabilities as like a proxy outcome in its own uh, in its own right and, and looking sort of an extension of things that we explored in that paper, um, which is looking for terms and phrases, just basically finding signal um, for areas that require additional qualitative or additional human exploration. Because if there seems to be a strong signal that there's a large percentage of undetermined death cases that have a high predicted probability of suicide. And the thing that they have in common is, is, is this common theme of, of losing one's job. I think that can at least um, give us signal for, for where more work needs to go in, um, in terms of qualitative research in, in, in looking at what's going on there. Can I make one point just sort of jumping off of Matt's, which is that it, specifically on that application, it might be interesting to elicit probabilistic estimates from the humans. Uh, and, and then you'd be able to kind of compare their, uh, their confidence with the, the posteriors that are getting kicked out by the model. Because like, especially in a situation where they're forced to make a binary judgment like that, there might actually be kind of uh, more tractable leverage for, for improving human coding if they're seeing that there's just sort of a systematic difference in, in their own uh, self-assessed uncertainty and the model-assessed uncertainty, as opposed to uh, just treating it as, as, a, as a binary judgment. That's a great idea. Yeah. Our, uh, our collaborators at the CDC have been a little slow to respond of late um, <laughs> since March, as you can imagine. But um, yeah, th that's, that's a great idea. It's something to think about in the future when they start answering our emails. There's something interesting about that idea as well, because your uncategorized in principle would be the middle ground of the um, of the coders, with the exception of the states that are mandate, if there's no note, it's categorized. Um, if you can figure out which of those cases, then you actually have, in principle, um, cases that would have certainty if they were in a different state, but because they're missing the note, wouldn't have certainty. And I don't know if that would give you a way to potentially validate um, your methods um, by training on the uh, I guess you would train on the don't need note states and then uh, do test on the note states or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea too. Then that's something I've thought about as well because like I, I'm sort of used to operating from a space where uh, it, there's a, a built-in way to validate whatever methods, whatever text methods are being applied by having full human coding or at least having certainty in the human codes but this is a very different realm where like the humans have coded it as something that they can't code then it's just another category of course right um, uh, it's really when they don't know that they can't code it it's it's the Rumsfeld category, right? Very nice. <laughs> There's definitely a paper here we should all write together. <laughs> I mean, it is a problem because there is no truth. That's really the fundamentally annoying thing here. <laughs> I mean, it's close to a truth, but it's, it's sort of quantum-like. Does anyone have um, other questions? Uh, if not, uh, thank you so much, Reagan, for the presentation. Um, it was really great to um, hear your talk. Um, and we'll see um, next week um, on the same time. So thank you so much. Thanks, thanks for having Reagan. me and thanks for your time, everybody. Take care.
Good job. Thanks, Megan.